My name is Sheena, and this is our weekly tarot reading for the Way of Namaste on Mighty Networks Community. This week, I am using the Osho Zen Tarot deck, and I'd love to start out with the Osho Zen Manifesto. Zen knows only a vast life, which contains all kinds of contradictions in a deep harmony. The night is in harmony with the day, and life is in harmony with death, and the earth is in harmony with the sky. The presence is in harmony with the absence. This immense harmony, this synchronicity, is the essential manifesto of Zen. This is the only way of life which respects and loves and denies nothing condemns nothing. Today is September 10th, 2024, and we begin with the heart of the matter, aloneness. When there is no significant other in our lives, we can either be lonely or enjoy the freedom that solitude brings. When we find no support among others for our deeply felt truths, we can either feel isolated and bitter or celebrate the fact that our vision is strong enough even to survive the powerful human need for the approval of family friends or colleagues. If you are facing such a situation now, be aware of how you are choosing to view your aloneness and take responsibility for the choices you have made. The humble figure in this card glows with a light that emanates from within. One of Gautam's Buddha's, Buddha's most significant contributions to the spiritual life of humankind was to insist to his disciples, be a light unto yourself. Ultimately, each of us must develop within ourselves the capacity to make our way through the darkness without any companions, maps, or guides. When you are alone, you are not alone. You are simply lonely. And there is a tremendous difference between loneliness and aloneness. When you are lonely, you're thinking of the other. You're missing the other. Loneliness is a negative state. You are feeling that it would have been better if the other was there your friend, your wife, your mother, your beloved, your husband, it would have been good if the other was there, but the other is not. Loneliness is absence of the other. Aloneness is the presence of oneself. Aloneness is very positive. It is presence, overflowing presence. You are so full of presence that you can fill the whole universe with your presence, and there is no need for anybody. Our opportunity this week is control. There is a time and a place for control, but if we put it in charge of our lives, we end up totally rigid. The figure is encased in the angles of pyramid shapes that surround him. Light glitters and glints off his shiny surfaces, but does not penetrate. It's as if he's almost mummified inside the structure he's built up around himself. His fists are clenched and his stare is blank, almost blind. The lower part of his body beneath the table is a knife point, a cutting edge that divides and separates. His world is ordered and perfect, but it is not alive. He cannot allow any spontaneity or vulnerability to enter it. The image of the king of clouds reminds us to take a deep breath. <sighs> Loosen our neckties and take it easy. If mistakes happen, it's okay. If things get a little out of hand, it's probably just what the doctor ordered. There is much, much more to life than being on top of things. Controlled persons are always nervous because deep down, turmoil is still hidden. If you are uncontrolled, flowing, alive, then you're not nervous. There is no question of being nervous. Whatsoever happens, happens. You have no expectations for the future. You're not performing. Then why should you be nervous? To control that mind, one has to remain so cold and frozen that no life energy is allowed to move into your limbs, into your body. If energy is allowed to move, those repressions will surface. That's why people have learned how to be cold, how to touch others and yet not touch them, how to see people and yet not see them. People live with cliches. Hello, how are you? <laughs> Nobody means anything. Those are just to avoid the real encounter of two persons. People don't look into each other's eyes. They don't hold stands. They don't try to feel each other's energies. They don't allow each other to pour. Very afraid, somehow just managing cold and dead in a straitjacket. 
This week we're in Jinky 47. This is the shadow of oppression, the gift of transmutation, and the divine essence of transfiguration. Oppression is when we're unwilling to be accountable and responsible for ourselves, for our thoughts, our actions, and our behaviors. We go about living as though life is happening to us, as though we are victims, just asleep at the wheel. And this low vibration keeps attracting more experiences to reflect who we believe we are, victims. When we are willing to be accountable and responsible for our actions, we rise into our gift frequency as creators. We see that life is happening for us. And we respond to life as though it is all in our best interest. Because it is. And now we are attracting more of this like vibration that life is happening for us. And it continues to until we reach our own dark night of the ego release our victim consciousness for good and we reach the enlightened state where life is actually flowing through us we know we are not victims we know we are co-creators and life continues to allow us to co-create an entirely new world it can feel disheartening sometimes when it feels like people can't hear us or understand us. And this week, the goddess has been giving me the imagery of a long tunnel. Sometimes we end up in situations where we're playing a game of telephone, speaking into this long tunnel. The words can become muffled, distorted, and by the time it reaches the other side, people really can't hear us. They can't match our frequency, and so they don't understand us. This is no one's fault. This is a vibrational reality, and sometimes our environment will reflect that. We're simply wasting our words, shouting into the void, because the person on the other side of this tunnel just isn't in a place to hear us. Maybe that will change, maybe not. But this imagery has personally helped me realize it's not something intentionally that someone is doing, trying not to hear me. They're just in a line that has a lot of feedback and distortion and as long as our energy is pure and we are speaking from our hearts authentically, we don't need to judge this experience. We can just see that perhaps the best thing we can do for them is to send our love and maintain our solid ground. When the distortion is cleared up, perhaps we'll have another opportunity to connect if it is in the highest alignment for all. Where we're coming from is the lovers. What we call love is really a whole spectrum of relating, reaching from the earth to the sky. As the most earthly level, love is sexual attraction. Many of us remain stuck there because our conditioning has burdened our sexuality with all kinds of expectations and repressions. Actually, the biggest problem with sexual love is that it never lasts. Only if we accept this fact can we then celebrate it for what it is and welcome its happening and say goodbye with gratitude when it's not. Then as we mature, we can begin to experience the love that exists beyond sexuality and honors the unique individuality of the other. We begin to understand that our partner often functions as a mirror, reflecting unseen aspects of our deeper self and supporting us to become whole. This love is based in freedom, not expectation or need. Its wings take us higher and higher toward the universal love that experiences all as one. These three things are to be taken note of. The lowest love is sex, it's physical. And the highest refinement of love is compassion. Sex is below low. love. Compassion is above love. Love is exactly in the middle. Very people know that what love is. 99% of people, unfortunately, think sexuality is love. It is not. Sexuality is very animal. It certainly has the potential of growing into love, but it's not actual love, only a potential. If you become aware and alert, meditative, then sex can be transferred into love. And if your meditativeness becomes total, absolute, love can be transformed into compassion. Sex is the need. Love is the flower. Compassion is the fragrance. Buddha has defined compassion as love 
plus meditation. When your love is not just a desire for the other, when, you, when your love is not just a need, when your love is a sharing, when your love is not that of a beggar, but an emperor, when your love is not asking for something in return, but is ready only to give, to give for the sheer joy of giving, then add meditation to it and the pure fragrance is released. That is compassion and compassion is the highest phenomenon. What we're conscious of this week is creativity. From the alchemy of fire and water below to the divine light entering from above, the future in this card is literally possessed by the creative force. Really, the experience of creativity is an entry into the mysterious. Technique, expertise, and knowledge are just tools. The key is to abandon oneself to the energy that fuels the birth of all things. This energy has no form or structure, yet all the forms and structures come out of it. It makes no difference what particular form your creativity takes. It can be painting or singing, planting a garden or making a meal. The important thing is to be open, to know what wants to be expressed through you. Remember that we don't possess our creations. They do not belong to us. Crude, true creativity arises from a union with the divine, with the mystical and the unknowable. Then it is both a joy for the creator and a blessing to others. Creativity is the quality that you bring to the quality that you are doing. It's the attitude. It's an inner approach. It's how you look at things. Not everybody can be a painter and there's no need also. If everybody is a painter, the world will be very ugly. It will be difficult to live. And not everybody can be a dancer. And there is no need. But everyone can be creative. Whatsoever you do, if you do it joyfully, if you do it lovingly, if your act of doing is purely economical, it's not creative. If you can go beyond purely being economical, then it is creative. If you have something growing out from within you. If it gives you growth, it's spiritual. It is creative. It is divine. You become more divine as you become more creative. All the religions of the world have said God is the creator. I don't know whether she is the creator or not, but one thing I know, the more creative you become, the more godly you become. When your creativity comes to a climax, then your whole life becomes creative. You live in God. So she must be the creator because people who have been creative have been closest to her. Love what you do and be meditative while you're doing it, whatsoever it is. Our future, success. This character is obviously on top of the world right now and the whole world is celebrating her success with a ticker tape parade. Because of your willingness to accept the recent challenges of life, you are now, or you will soon be, enjoying a wonderful ride on the tiger of success. Welcome it, enjoy it, and share your joy with others. And remember that all bright parades have a beginning and an end. If you keep this in mind and squeeze every drop of juice out of the happiness you are experiencing now, you'll be able to take the future as it comes without regrets. But don't be tempted to try to hold on to this abundant moment or coat it in plastic so that it lasts forever. The greatest wisdom to keep in mind with all the phenomena in the parade of your life, whether they be valleys or peaks, is that this too will pass. Celebrate, yes, and keep on riding the tiger. Watch the waves in the ocean. The higher the wave goes, the deeper is the wake that follows it. One moment you are the wake. Another moment you are the hollow wake that follows. Enjoy both and don't get addicted to one. Don't say, I would always like to be on the peak. It's just not possible. Simply see the fact it is not possible. It has never happened and it will never happen. It is simply impossible, not in the nature of things. So what to do? Enjoy the peak while it lasts and then Enjoy the valley when it comes. What's wrong with the valley? What's wrong with being low? It is a relaxation. A peak is an excitement and nobody can exist continuously in an excitement. 
what we're unconscious of this week is integration. The image of integration is the unio mystico, the fusion of opposites. This is a time of communication between the previously experienced dualities of life. Rather than night opposing day, dark suppressing the light, they work together to create a unified whole, turning endlessly on into each other, each containing its deepest core, the seed of its opposite. The eagle and the swan are both beings of light and majesty. The eagle is the embodiment of power and aloneness. The swan is the embodiment of space and purity, gently floating and diving upon and within the element of the emotions, entirely content and complete within her perfection and beauty. We are the union of eagle and swan, male and female, fire and water, life and death. The card of integration is the simple, the symbol of self-creation, new life, and the mystical union, otherwise known as alchemy. The conflict is in man. Unless it's resolved there, it cannot be resolved anywhere else. The politics is within you. It is between the two parts of your mind. A very small bridge exists. If that bridge is broken through some accident, through some physiological defect or something else, the person becomes split. The person becomes two persons and the phenomena of schizophrenia or split personality happens. If the bridge is broken and the bridge is very fragile, then you become two. You behave like two persons. In the morning, you are very loving, very beautiful. In the evening, you are very angry, absolutely different. You don't remember your morning. How can you remember? Another mind was functioning and the person becomes two persons. If this bridge is strengthened so much that the two minds disappear as two and become one, then integration, then crystallization arises. What George Gurdjieff used to call the crystallization of being is nothing more than these two minds becoming one, the meeting of the male and the female within, the meeting of yin and yang, the meeting of the left and the right, the meeting of logic and illogic, the meeting of Plato and Aristotle. What we're aware of this week? Traveling. The tiny figure moving on the path through this beautiful landscape is not concerned about the goal. He or she knows that this journey is not the goal. The pilgrimage itself is the sacred place. Each step on the path is important in itself. When this card appears in a reading, it indicates a time of movement and change. It may be a physical movement from one place to the next or an inner movement from one way of being to another. But whatever the case, this card promises that the going will be easy and will bring a sense of adventure and growth. There's no need to struggle or plan too much. The traveling card also reminds us to accept and embrace the new, just as when we travel to another country with a different culture and environment than the one we're accustomed to. This attitude of openness and acceptance invites new friends and experiences into our lives. Life is a continuity, always and always. There's no final destination, it's going towards. Just like the pilgrimage, just the journey in itself, not reaching to some point, no goal, just dancing and being in pilgrimage, moving joyously without bothering any about any destination. What will you do by getting to a destination? Nobody has asked this because everybody's trying to have some destination in life, but the implications? If you really reach the destination of life, then what? Then you'll look very embarrassed. There's nowhere to go. You have reached to the final destination and in the journey, you have lost everything. You had to lose everything. So standing naked at the final destination, you'll look around and think, what was the point? You were hurrying so hard and you were worrying so much. And this is the outcome. So relax, sweet child, and trust the adventure of this life. There is nowhere to run off to. It's all here now. So enjoy it. Our environment this week is consciousness. Most of the cards in this suit of the mind are either cartoon-like or troubled because the influence of the mind of our lives is generally either ridiculous or oppressive. But this card of consciousness shows a very shows a vast Buddha figure. He's so expansive, he's gone even beyond the stars, and above his head, 
is pure emptiness. He represents the consciousness that's available to all who become a master of the mind and can use it as the servant it's meant to be. When you choose this card, it means that there is a crystal clarity available right now, detached, rooted in the deep stillness that lies at the core of your being. There is no desire to understand from the perspective of the mind. The understanding you have now is essential, whole, in harmony with the pulse of life itself. Accept this great gift and share it. We come from the unknown and we go on moving into the unknown. We'll come again. We've been here thousands of times and we will be here thousands of times. Our essential being is immortal, but our body, our embodiment is mortal. Our frame in which we are, our houses, the mind, the body, they are made of material things. They will get tired, they will get old, they will die. But your consciousness, for which Bodhidharma uses the word no mind, God of Buddha also uses the word no mind, is something beyond the body and mind, something beyond everything. That no mind is eternal. It comes into expression and goes again into the unknown. This movement from the unknown to the known and from the known to the unknown continues for eternity. Unless somebody becomes enlightened, then this is her last life. Then this flower will not come back again. This flower has become aware of itself, not needing to come back to life because life is nothing but a school in which to learn. She has learned the lesson. She is now beyond illusions. She will move from the unknown for the first time, not into the unknown, but into the unknowable. Our hopes and fears this week is sharing. The queen of fire is so rich, so much of a queen that she can afford to give. It doesn't even occur to her to take inventories or to put something aside for later. She dispenses her treasures without limits, welcoming all, and sun-dry to partake of the abundance, fertility, and light that surrounds her. When you draw this card, it suggests that you too are in a situation where you have an opportunity to share your love, your joy, and your laughter. And in sharing, you will feel even more full. There's no need to go anywhere or to make any special effort. You find that you can enjoy sensuality without possessiveness or attachment. And you can give birth to a child or to a new project with an equal sense of creativity fulfilled. Everything around you seems to be coming together now. Enjoy it. Ground yourself in it. And let the abundance in and around you overflow. As you move above to the fourth center, that is the heart, your whole life becomes a sharing of love. The third center has created the abundance of love. By reaching to the third center in meditation, you've become so overflowing with love, with compassion, and you want to share it. It happens at the fourth center, the heart. That's why even in the ordinary world, people think love comes out of the heart. For them, it's just hearsay. They've heard it. They don't know it because they've never reached to their heart. But the meditator finally reaches to the heart and he has reached to the center of his being, the third center. Suddenly, an explosion of love and compassion and joy and blissfulness and benediction has arisen in him, such a force that it hits his heart and opens the heart. The heart is just in the middle of all your seven centers, three centers below, three centers above. You have come exactly to the middle. Our outcome this week is politics. All but the most innocent and sincere of us have a politician lurking somewhere in our minds. In fact, the mind is political. Its very nature is to plan and scheme and try to manipulate situations and people so that it can get what it wants. Here, the mind is represented by the snake, covered with clouds and speaking with a forked tongue. But the important thing to realize about this card is that both faces are false. The sweet, innocent, trust me face is a mask, and the evil, toxic, I'll have my way with you face is a mask too. Politicians don't have real faces. The whole game is a lie. Take a look at yourself to see if you have been playing this game. What you see might be painful, but not as painful as continuing to play. 
It doesn't serve anybody's interest in the end, least of all yours. Whatever you might achieve in this way will just turn to dust in your hands. Anybody who can be a good pretender, a hypocrite, will become your leader politically, will become your priest religiously. That when he needs, that what he needs is hypocrisy. All that he needs is cunningness. All that he needs is a facade to hide behind. Your politicians live double lives. Your priests live double lives. One from the front door, the other from the back door. And the back door life is their real life. Those front door smiles are just false. Those faces looking so innocent are just cultivated. If you want to see the reality of the politician, you'll have to see him from his back door. There he is in his nudity, as he is, and so is the priest. These two kinds of cunning people have dominated humanity. And they found out very early on that if you want to dominate humanity, make it weak, make it feel guilty, make it feel unworthy, destroy its dignity, take all glory away from it, humiliate it. And they have found such subtle ways of humiliation that they don't come in the picture at all. They leave it to you to humiliate yourself, to destroy yourself. They have taught you a kind of slow suicide. If it feels in alignment for us, I invite us into our breath now. <sighs> Inviting in our deepest breath, our power, our full expression. We are such powerful creators and there are so many programs out there designed to keep us in a state of forgetting, of feeling less than. We free our will when we take our power back, when we remember that we are perfect, that we are whole. We are holy, we are complete, and we are impeccable creations of humanity. Let's exhale. <sighs> Releasing something, maybe letting something go. So this week and every week and every day, touch yourself like you love yourself. Develop a pleasure practice that empowers you. Whether engaging in sacred sexuality with a lover or offering this pleasure to yourself, you deserve to feel the ecstatic bliss of your body's ability to sense heightened feelings of joy, without shame, without guilt. Create a ritual that allows you to come into contact with the lava of love that is within you. So many people have been cut from their pleasure to their bodies. So many people have been shamed for their desires. So many people have been programmed to view sex as less than holy. And the porn industry and movies and show business and Hollywood has all tried to rob empowered creators of their most divine sex magic. Because it's been turned into a performance with a disconnection to source. When we reclaim our pleasure, when we reclaim our sex magic, we reclaim our power. This week, feel the power of your creator consciousness alive within you. Honor it. Cherish it. Devote yourself to it. Reclaim your pleasure. If you have experienced sexual trauma, you are not alone. Most of humanity has experienced the core sexual trauma from feeling disconnected from the divine. And it happened in our delivery. The umbilical cord was severed. And this idea that there was a disconnection was implanted into us. However, it's simply not true. We are connected. We are human. And we are also divine. We are the creators of bliss and joy. So let's create it for us and for each other. Seven times seven times seven 
generations back and seven times seven times seven generations forward for the highest and greatest good for all sentient life. And as always, for the highest and greatest choice for all sentient life. Because we are here now, sovereign, having made the choice to be here now. So let's have fun. Let's make today an adventure. Let's hold ourselves today like a newborn baby child. I love you. Namaste.